go. All right, uh, thank you folks for taking a moment out of your schedules to uh, stop by. Uh, I'd also like to thank our hosts from, from Richardson. I think over the course of the next few days, you'll hear a lot of interesting information. So I'm Eric Hyam, and I'm with Strategy Analytics, and I'm a director in our strategic technologies practice. And I'd like to spend the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes talking to you about what we see as uh, the trends in radar communications and electronic warfare and uh, why we think GAN will be a pivotal technology uh, for those applications. So I'd like to spend a few moments. Uh, sure. OK. OK. Well, um, OK. Yeah, but, yeah, but uh, I think. Okay, is that, is that better at the end? Beautiful, thank you. All right, so then I'd like to spend a, a few moments uh, introducing strategy analytics uh, and our defense service, as well as the methodology we use to analyze um, markets and the enabling technologies. We'll take a look at the trends in EW radar and communications, and really what's driving uh, the, the new technologies and, and why GAN will play an important part in that. So Strategy Analytics, uh, we are a global market research and uh, consulting company. We've been around since the 1960s, and we really work with our clients to help them understand what's happening in markets today, help them analyze forces for change, so new market entrants, new technologies, new processes, and then finally help them develop uh, actionable plans for, uh, for the future. We work with knowledge centers. And these are broadly defined areas of expertise. And we have them currently in wireless, uh, consumer, automotive, telecom, aerospace, and defense. And then the one that we'll be focusing on today, which is strategic uh, technologies that really enable uh, all of these, these uh, application areas we'll be discussing. <coughs> and uh, as an example, our defense knowledge center revolves around what we call our advanced defense systems uh, service, which is designed to meet the needs of defense market planners and works to analyze top level information like platforms and contracts, but then also works to uh, analyze and understand the enabling technologies. So uh, as an example, we will, uh, we, we've developed a methodology that will take top level trends, so defense budgets, contract announcements, uh, company profiles, segments them into the four domains shown here, land, space, uh, air, and sea. And then uh, that allows us to generate forecasts for opportunities today as well as in the future. From that, that system level uh, expenditure standpoint, we'll let's take a, a more specific look at, at platforms and uh, systems and that revolve around what we call advanced defense systems. So we'll take that top level expenditure, break it down into electronic content in the six um, balloons that you see around the ADS balloon. Uh, and, and then that allows us again to segment that, that top level spending into a, uh, an electronic content. From there, we will develop a bill of material analyses as well as functional block diagrams. And uh, this allows us to develop forecasts for functional components based on quantity, market value, and technology, both for today and, uh, and looking forward. So let's take a look at the trends in these, these three different areas. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not surprising to say that compound semiconductor technology really has a long and uh, checkered history enabling what we're calling the first line of defense. And uh, arguably, it really was the uh, defense both spending as well as research that really launched the compound semiconductor industry. So it really shouldn't come as much of a surprise that we are saying that that, that segment, and in particular radar communications and electronic warfare, will really drive the technology and the system developments uh, going forward. So let, let's take a look at electronic warfare. Pretty typically this big area, electronic warfare, is broken down into electronic attack, which is using uh, energy to neutralize hostile capabilities, electronic protection, 
using energy to protect friendly forces, and then support, which is uh, identifying and, and kind of categorizing what that energy is. <clears throat> so the trends in this area is all, all of these devices need to be very broadband. Uh, if they're a receiver, they also need to have high sensitivity so that you can identify that signal as quickly, as far out as you possibly can. Uh, if it's a jammer, it needs to have high transmit power. And uh, whether it's either a jammer or a receiver, you need high selectivity so that you can identify and, and categorize what type of signal you're dealing with. So those trends really are pushing towards a lot more use of digital signal processing schemes and then wideband receiver architectures. <clears throat> In the, uh, the radar domain, the high profile examples have really been on uh, fighter jets. And so things like the F-22, the F-35, Joint Strike Fighter have, uh, have gone pretty strongly towards AESA radars, and that acronym stands for Active Electronically Scanned Arrays, and that really relies on many typically lower power solid state modules. And with that approach, you can develop multiple beams, and you can uh, dynamically determine the, uh, the mission of each of those beams. So that's a tremendous increase in capability. So it's, the, the trend is that all of the new uh, platforms are looking very strongly at AESA radars, but it's such an increase in capability that the, uh, some of the legacy programs, like we show F-15, F-16, et cetera, they're looking at retrofitting, uh, where it makes sense and where there's enough size available. <coughs> the, the idea, the ESA idea is so prevalent that it's even uh, migrating to different domains, if you will. So here we have an example of a Cassidian naval radar, where they're using uh, ESA radar principles that are enabled, the modules are enabled by GAN, along with uh, some of the kind of the older school uh, mechanical rotation. And, and what they get out of this is a multifunctional uh, radar f in, in that naval environment. <coughs> the same is true in the, uh, the ground environment. So here we see uh, an example of the Gator program with a, a photograph uh, courtesy of Northrop Grumman, where they've taken <coughs> the, the functions of four or five different radars and replaced them with that single radar, that single active electronically scanned array, typically enabled by GAN devices that you see there. <clears throat> in, in the communications area, uh, the, uh, the trend is towards what's called a net-centric battlefield strategy. And in that uh, strategy, you've got potentially different arms of the military or even different countries, and you've got a lot of geographical dispersion. And with this idea, all of those people need to have access to uh, the information that everyone is generating. So you think of it as a big database. Everyone needs to be able to access that quickly uh, with high capacity uh, devices. So these new radios that will be the nodes or the access points in this idea, uh, first of all, they're moving towards the IP data, uh, high capacity, high data rate. With the number of legacy radios in the field, they need to handle multiple modes or waveforms. And again, they need to handle the uh, kind of the conventional frequency ranges that are going from 30-ish megahertz up to three gigahertz. And so taken in total, those are all really driving uh, software-defined radios, as well as the next step, which are cognitive radios, which we'll be able to sense where the, uh, the, the best frequency and the best operating conditions are. So we've talked quickly about a number of different domains, if you will, and a number of different applications, but there are a few uh, common threads, really, that are running through everything. And, uh, you know, of course, everyone wants cheaper, faster, and better. And that's really whether it's uh, defense or commercial. But the, uh, the, the military has really taken this to heart, and they've developed a, a methodology, if you will, that they call SWAP-C, size, weight, power, and cost where they're really looking to design the new systems with that in mind. How can they, uh, they best optimize those parameters? And I think that we're really at a, uh, a point of inflection with technology. I don't think the requirements in the field that drive the systems, that drive the enabling technologies, I don't think it's just a, an evolution of what was there in the past. I think when we start to talk about the, the bandwidth that we need, uh, the power and power efficiency, along with the linearization and, and the linearity that we need, 
Uh, it, it's, a, it, it's that sea change in development. And so I think it's things like uh, the, the compound semiconductor technology will be front and center still, and it's things like GAN that will be enabling uh, those kinds of developments. So let's look at the, the role that we think GAN will play. And uh, this chart really talks to the, uh, the continuum of power versus frequency for the, uh, the applications. And you see a lot of technologies in there, and, and we probably could add a few more. But the, one of the unique features of GAN is that it will provide a good solution really for any intersection of power and frequency. So that's really one of the unique capabilities and, and features of GAN. Uh, this capabilities table with GAN at the end, we're probably all aware of the advantages from a band gap and a breakdown voltage and a power density standpoint. <clears throat> if you couple those with uh, silicon carbide or some other kind of substrate that allows you to improve the thermal characteristics, and then you work on uh, packaging techniques that will allow you to maintain those thermal characteristics that you've gotten, you get solutions for these three domains that we've just talked about. In electronic warfare, uh, you can easily do the broad bandwidth and the high power that you're talking about. On the AESA radar, as we've discussed, that typically involves somewhere from hundreds to thousands of modules. And uh, it's, it's interesting because this market is really developing along sort of two axes. The, the first one I mentioned is the, the fast jet, the fighter jet. And there, there's a, a premium in making things smaller because obviously you've got a plane and it needs to be uh, maneuverable. <clears throat> so that's pretty obvious. But what is perhaps not quite so obvious is the other axis, where if you've got a fixed size, and this was the case in some of the land and the naval uh, installations that I showed, that fixed size, using a smaller module, you can use more modules, which means more capability. So the, the axis really is smaller, lighter, faster on one side, more capability for the same size on the other side. And then on the tactical radio communications end of things, uh, you know, again, that's the, the broad bandwidth and the, the high power capability that will enable this, this net-centric global information grid idea. <clears throat> so uh, we are bullish on GAN and its, its participation in the military market. Uh, even in is starting to uh, take shape, we are forecasting that out in 2015, more than two-thirds of the market will be military for GAN. Uh, so still, still very important for the, uh, the, the military usage. So in conclusion, uh, semiconductor technology has long enabled, uh, long and checkered past, as I said, with the, uh, the defense industry. We don't see any reason for that to change. And in fact, we think that this, this uh, point of inflection that I mentioned with uh, the performance that's being required by radar communication and EW systems will be good for GAN. It will play right into some of the technology advantages that GAN can offer. <clears throat> and so other than just being a good technology, as we mentioned, we think that the, the levers, if you will, will be uh, bandwidth capability, power density, um, linearity, and um, the, the frequency capability. And so again, uh, we're still thinking that even with that commercial market starting to materialize finally, uh, that by 2015, GAN will still be about two thirds of that market. Uh, and so with that, I probably have a, a couple of moments for questions. So the question, uh, if anyone, or for anyone who didn't hear it, was in, in the AESA radar, uh, sort of what's the, uh, the power levels of the, uh, the modules? <clears throat> and I think it, that varies depending on what the mission is, if you will. If you take a, uh, a land-based phased array or surveillance radar and over the horizon radar, I mean, you may be looking at, at generating you know, megawatts of power for that. So uh, that would then determine the number of, of smaller modules that you're getting. If you're talking about a fighter jet, then you're kind of in the, you know, the, the tens or hundreds of watts. Uh, so that, that then again determines the number. You know, we're seeing, I, I think, uh, modules be a single module 
be anywhere from kind of single digit watts to sort of, you know, 10 to 15 type, type number of watts. And then, of course, that d depends on the size. Uh, so hopefully that answer is great. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, we're, we're uh, we are a bit conservative, and uh, if you've been following the GAN market for any length of time, it's always been that that oasis on the horizon that you just you see it, but you can't quite touch it. Uh, so we we may be on the we'll definitely be on the low side, but I'd be surprised if we are proven to be tremendously low. But we're talking about sort of 180 million dollars total in uh, in 2015, and you know the the big wild card there is commercial. I mean, the government, even though if you looked at that chart, uh, you see the percentage dropping. The overall government expenditure will be increasing, but not dramatically. I mean, that's, that's program driven. The real wild card is um, the commercial market. And if that pushes out another couple of years, then that percentage of military will be, will be increasing. But it does look like, like some commercial activities are finally seeing traction. You're welcome. Anything else? All right, uh, thank you for your attention.